Are you ready? Annie was standing impatiently at the door. She looked good. Knee-length skirt, matching brown jacket, the white blouse underneath she'd bought for her job interview a few weeks before. High heels too, which was unusual for her. But then she wasn't going out with me, so didn't need to spare my feelings. While she was going to the club with Veronica, I'd somehow been roped into babysitting Veronica's daughter, Polly. It was the second Friday in a row I'd been accorded such a privilege, and the second Friday in a row that I felt thoroughly stupid accepting the instruction. Babysitting was for teenage girls, not 35-year-old husbands. And Polly was a real pain, to boot. I'd complained a little but got nowhere. Annie and Veronica were having a girls' night, I was brusquely informed, and meeting other girlfriends while they were out, and I would be completely out of place. When the girls' night was repeated just a week later, I was told to stop my complaining and, more sternly, to stop being selfish. It's hardly the world's greatest imposition, is it? Annie had said, basically you can sit on your backside and watch TV. Same thing you'd have done here. It had only been a month or so since Veronica and Polly had moved in next door, but it felt like Annie had changed in that time. Sure, she'd always been the one who wore the trousers in our relationship, but it seemed like her patience with me was wearing thinner and thinner by the day. Comments were creeping in too. Little remarks about my unemployment. Asides about my lack of usefulness around the house. Jokes about my height. Just the night before I'd been reading quietly in my room when I heard Annie call me downstairs. She and Veronica had been sharing a bottle of wine, and the two of them had reached that giggly stage. Polly was there too, the girl sitting cross-legged on the floor watching Dad's army while eating a bowl of ice cream, and she looked annoyed when Veronica asked her to stand up. What's going on? I asked, as a smiling Annie pushed me towards the center of the room. Just a bit of fun, Oliver, Annie said, her breath tinged with the smell of cheap wine. Mummy, I was watching the TV. Polly complained. I'm going to miss the best bit. We just want to see, Veronica said, positioning her daughter so she was standing with her back to mine. Stop this, I said, squirming. But Annie was enjoying herself too much to let me go, and held my arms down by my side. I could feel the sleeves of Polly's dress against my arms, and her brown hair push against my too long blonde locks. You're right, Veronica exclaimed. She is taller. Really, mummy? Polly said, a hint of excitement in her voice now. I'm really taller than Uncle Oliver? How funny. You've shot up in the last few months, Veronica said, with her daughter still pressed against my back, as though she needed to see it for longer to believe it. Oh, Oliver, Annie began to laugh, finally pulling me away and into a tipsy bear hug, my little man. Don't you worry about it. Size isn't everything. Easy for her to say. She wasn't shorter than the prim and proper little eleven-year-old girl next door. Can I go now? I said grumpily. The mirth in the room was almost too much to bear, especially when Polly skipped next to me again, clearly wanting to make sure her mummy was correct. She ran a hand from the top of her head across mine and giggled at the space between her hand and my head. At least two inches mummy, she reported proudly. Then she stopped and shot Veronica a toothy grin, technically, doesn't that mean I should be babysitting Uncle Oliver, not the other way around? The women laughed, and I felt my face redden. Stop being silly, I said, angrily, I've had enough of this nonsense. So, it was in a dark frame of mind that I followed Annie out the door and into Veronica's, ready for my second week of babysitting. Veronica looked almost as pretty as Annie as she opened the door. She'd gone for a dress though, a black cocktail number that was a bit too much for the local social club, and she hadn't skimped on the makeup either. You look great, Annie said, as the women kissed cheeks. Little Oliver, Veronica said, patting me on the back. This caused both women to laugh again, though it was an embarrassed and illicit giggle, like a couple of schoolgirls who'd stumbled upon a rude word. Well, I'll just go home then, I spat, having had quite enough mockery for one week. Oh, Oliver, it's just a joke, Annie said, pulling me back, really, you're so sensitive recently. Yes, I'm sorry, Oliver, really, Veronica added, not looking very sorry, before turning to call Polly in the hallway. 
Yes, mummy, Polly said, skipping towards us. She really was all legs. Tonight she tied her brown hair into a high ponytail, which made her look even taller still, as did her blue denim dungarees, which she wore over a pink t-shirt. Bed at 9 p.m. little lady, Veronica said, giving her daughter a kiss, and don't cause any trouble for Uncle Oliver. I won't mummy, she said. She might have looked and sounded all sweetness and light, but she didn't fool me. She was a snake, just like her mother. Just like all the bullies I'd grown up with, in fact. The boys who pushed me into the mud. The giggly girls who forced me into girls' toilets at school. The men at the club who laughed at the half-pint man with Annie, the one who was too small to play snooker. The Friday before I contented myself with a book while Polly had watched the TV. It hadn't been so bad really, other than Polly complaining when her bedtime rolled around. I'd let her stay up for an extra half an hour which had done the trick, and despite Veronica asking that I make sure the girl brushed her teeth and combed out her hair, I had no intention of doing any such thing, instead just peeking in at around ten to make sure she was in bed, which she was, and with her teddy bears cuddled around her. On this particular Friday though, Polly was like a different creature. After half an hour or so of TV she switched it off with a groan and turned her attention my way. I'd barely noticed her to this point, as engrossed as I was with my book, which I loaned from the library that morning. What are you reading? Polly asked in a sing-song voice. Ian Fleming. You only live twice, I replied, almost by instinct. What's it about? I let out a little sigh and lowered the book, finding her large brown eyes staring intently at me. It's a spy novel. Four grown-ups. A spy book? She said excitedly, I like spy books. Mummy bought me Harriet the Spy a few weeks ago. It's in my room. Have you read it? Of course not, I spat. Why don't you just go back to watching the TV, hey? But I want to read your book, she said, her voice drowning in petulance. I'm so bored. It's not a book for little girls, I snapped, shuffling away from her. She placed herself firmly next to me on the sofa, and I couldn't help but wince slightly at how her legs reached the floor fully, while mine were an inch or so short. Polly seemed to notice me glancing at this, and it brought a toothy smile to her face. Oh yeah, I forgot that I'm taller than you now, she said proudly. Can we check again? No. Oh, please? Oh, actually, let me mark you on my door. Mummy marked my height when we moved in. She did it in our old house too. It was funny to see how little I was. Polly, be quiet, I snapped. No, she snapped back, jumping to the floor and crossing her arms over her dungarees. I want to measure you on my door. Come on. I was almost too shocked to react as the girl grabbed both my arms, sending poor James Bond fluttering to the carpet. Her expression had changed completely once again. There was nothing sweet or mirthful there now, only a stony-eyed determination to have her way. And for a terrible moment, as I found myself foisted upwards and standing next to her, it looked like she just might. It was only looking at her once more and realizing all over that I was dealing with an eleven-year-old girl, one in a pink t-shirt with frilled sleeves and who slept with her teddy bears, that focused my mind. The rest happened almost instinctively, like a mother who just knows how to feed her young. You're being a very naughty little girl, I yelled, pulling myself from her grasp with a strength I didn't know I had and then somehow, in some manner, managing to sit back down on the sofa and to pull her across my lap, so that her legs were pointing out towards the TV and her ponytail was dangling down on the other side towards the carpet. What are you doing? Polly cried out. Let me go. But the deed was done within seconds, my hand firmly down on the bottom of her dungarees in three sharp motions, before pulling her up to stand in front of me. There, that's what bad little girls get, I panted. She had tears in her eyes and was rubbing her hands on her bottom, clearly in shock. Do you need to go to bed, madam? It was only 7.30. I knew how such a threat would terrify a child her age. But she didn't answer. Instead, she just kept staring. Those brown eyes bearing down on me like headlights on a dark country lane. Well? I said, feeling oddly elated. I didn't have many chances to feel so grown up and I wasn't about to waste one. 
Suddenly Polly represented so perfectly all those horrible people who'd made me miserable and that I was complete control of the situation made my heart sing. I hate you, she whispered eventually, her eyes still red and her cheeks flushed. Well, that's too bad. But next time perhaps you'll do what I say, little madam? You're the little one, she screamed at me, before running from the room and upstairs, where I heard her bedroom door slam. I thought about following her, maybe even about giving her another smack for being rude, but in the end settled for the quiet of the front room. I tried to read again but found the words too hard to take in, so ended up spending an hour or so just lying on the sofa looking up at the ceiling and wondering what Polly, directly above me, was thinking now. And then drifting on to wondering what Annie and Veronica were up to, and whether they were drunk, and what Veronica was going to say about me discipling her daughter. Who cares, I thought bravely, they left me in charge. It's up to me. At half nine I crept upstairs to check on Polly and was somewhat surprised and relieved to find her tucked up in bed, Teddy's to her side and nighty on, fast asleep. You did the right thing, I told myself proudly, she knows her place now. I felt good. Wonderful, in fact. Like the natural order of things had been restored. My manhood reinstated. That I dealt with the situation in much the same way as a teenage girl might have done, giving the younger girl a smack, didn't hamper my delight. Polly knew not to mess with Uncle Oliver, even if he were shorter. I needn't have worried about Veronica's reaction, either. If the little miss deserved it, then fine, she said, and though she was half-cut and stumbling around, I could tell she'd feel the same in the morning. Annie was even more drunk, if such a thing were possible, and I had to help into her bed, removing her clothes one by one and sliding her nightgown over her head. In the moments where she was naked I thought about pressing her onto the bed and making love to her it had been a while and I was on a roll but I resisted the urge and tucked her up tightly instead. What I hadn't expected, and wasn't best pleased about, was that I'd be back babysitting Polly the very next afternoon. We're getting our hair and nails done, Annie proclaimed croakily, before taking a slow sip of coffee. Her face was still smudged with a little makeup and her hair had been hastily and messily put up, but she still looked gorgeous somehow. Can't you take Polly with you? I replied. No, she'd get bored. But don't worry. She's having a little friend round so I'm sure they'll keep each other entertained and out of your hair. Wait, hold on a second. It's one thing looking after Polly, but her friend too? I'm not a child minder, Annie. She looked up at the ceiling and groaned. It's just for a few hours. Crikey Oliver, can you really not handle a couple of little girls? The little girls were playing hopscotch when we arrived and I was slightly aghast to see that the friend, Fiona, was just as tall as Polly, if not a little bigger. An Irish-looking girl with ginger hair pulled into two pigtails and a freckled face, she was wearing an orange and white spotted dress and had a voice strong enough to float in through the closed kitchen door. Meanwhile Polly was wearing a grey button-up pinafore dress that looked a little shorter than intended, probably due to her growth spurt, and I felt a slight churn in the stomach as I wondered what she might say to me. Stop it! She's just a little girl. A little girl playing hopscotch with her friend. Who cares what she thinks, I thought, resolutely. Girls, I'm going now, Veronica called out, opening the kitchen door slightly, be back around five. Okay mummy. Polly called back. Uncle Oliver is here in case anything happens, she added, turning to me and winking, tough Uncle Oliver, hey? Who'd have thought it? Well, air, I began to mutter, feeling my cheeks redden. It's good, Veronica said, smiling, she needs discipline. We'll walk all over you otherwise. Just like her mother, Annie said. Yes, just like her mother, Veronica repeated. My instructions for the afternoon were clear enough. The girls didn't need anything, so just make sure nothing untoward happens. I could do that. Sitting down at the kitchen table so I could see them, they'd moved on to skipping now, each of them shouting out how many they'd done in row, I took out the Fleming novel and started to read. With the sun beating through the window and with faint birdsong sometimes making its way through the screeching of the girls, I had paused to think how life really wasn't all that bad. I had a gorgeous wife, and a lovely home, and James Bond was sorting out the Ruskies. Hell, life really was good. 
Oliver, a girlish voice called in, just as the door opened. It was Fiona, and she was red-faced from exertion, with the top of her dress dampened with sweat, will you hold the skipping rope for us please? I told you, don't bother asking him, Polly spat, pushing her head through the crack in the door and looking at me with all the venom an eleven-year-old girl could possibly muster, he's mean. Oh, please Oliver, Fiona continued, it's no fun unless there's three. Do you know three six nine? Sorry girls, I'm busy. Ridiculously, I felt somewhat intimidated by the pair of them. Confirmation, if needed, that I'd never be James Bond. Fiona was just as bullshy as Polly. Stop being boring, she said, grabbing my right arm, we need three. Pull, grab his other arm. Polly looked at me for a moment first, clearly remembering the night before, but after perhaps realizing she had safety in numbers, greedily caught hold of my left wrist. You're right, Polly, he's so little, Fiona said in amazement, as I found myself thrust between them. He's a real baby, Polly said nastily, her toothy grin well and truly back, come on Uncle Oliver, we know you want to skip with us. Fiona giggled at this. We'll be nice, honest. Girls, stop this now. I cried out, but my attempts to squirm free were useful in the face on their combined strength. I needed to get one of the hands free, but the way both girls had strong hold of my wrists made it impossible. And it wasn't exactly like I could kick out at them, especially Fiona. She probably had a bodybuilder dad, or a rebel older brother. I didn't need that. He's so weak, Polly laughed, as I was pushed out the door. Stand there, Fiona said, pointing at a patch of grass to her right and handing me the plastic handle of the long skipping rope. Absolutely not, I replied, laying the handle down to the ground and beginning my walk back to the kitchen with about as much dignity as I could muster. Stop him, Polly screeched, the girls laughing as they raced up behind me and somehow managed to pull both arms behind my back. Really girls, stop his nonsense, I shouted, aghast at my inability to pull clear, an effort which simply left me stumbling face first to the ground, with Fiona wasting no time in jumping onto my back, after pulling my arms underneath her. Your hair is so long, Polly said, as she sat cross-legged next to me, her Mary Jane's about all I could see, isn't it pretty, Fiona, she added, running a hand through it. Just like a girl. I'd had just about enough. You girls better let me up right now, or... Why don't you want to skip with us, Uncle Oliver, Polly said, in her sing-song voice, is it because you're a boy? I suppose you're right. Boys don't skip. I'm not a boy, I cried, I'm a man. And... Hear that Fiona, he's not a boy, Polly giggled, that's all right then. From the pocket of her pinafore I could just about make out her producing two little gray hairbands. What do you think, Fiona? Pigtails for a new girl. Definitely, Fiona said. Hill, I mean she'll look very pretty. Polly, no! I yelled, squirming harder now. But Fiona just redoubled her efforts, and not even my pathetic little kicks outwards could help. Instead, I had to suffer the ignominy of feeling Polly pulling my hair into two large bunches, and then twisting it around for a good few minutes while the girls giggled at their handiwork. Let's see, Fiona said, finally climbing off my back. I got up quickly, but Polly was even quicker to grab my arms again, only this time pulling them in front of me so she could see her efforts more clearly. I could see it too. It was impossible not to. Dangling down my white shirt were two girly plated pigtails, just like the ones Fiona was sporting. Better, Polly laughed. Now, time for skipping. Absolutely not. I said again, moving a hand straight up to start undoing the awful mess she'd left me in. Don't you dare! Fiona yelled. Naughty girl, Polly said, slapping my hand away, you're being a very bad little madam. That's funny, Fiona said, look, I think he's crying. I'm not, I muttered back, feeling completely useless. I should give you a smack, Polly mused, suddenly looking very thoughtful, I bet I could too. Yes. That's what I'll do if you don't play nicely, and if you dare touch your pretty hair again. Polly, please. I said pathetically, while Fiona handed me the end of the rope again. Three, six, nine, first. Polly, you can go, Fiona said, you know the words, 
don't you Olivia? Olivia! That's cute, Polly laughed. Well, he can't be Uncle Oliver, can he? Not with his pretty pigtails, and when he's skipping rope with us girls. I suppose not, Polly said, a twinkle in her eyes. He's much nicer as Olivia anyway. Not a big, horrible man like Uncle Oliver. I didn't know the words, but the girls were only too happy to teach them. It was completely and utterly horrifying, and for some reason seeing Polly's short skirt flip up to reveal her white knickers underneath made it so much worse, the realization racing through me that I'd just been bullied by a couple of tiny little girls. For Fiona's turn me changed the song to one about Robin Hood, which was really just counting how many kisses he'd get. I winced at Fiona's pigtails bouncing around her, and worried at what might come next. Your turn Olivia, Fiona panted. Oh no. I really. Olivia, don't be naughty, Polly warned. You're one of the girls now, remember? That means you have to take a turn. I'll be rubbish, I said, for some reason. That's okay, we'll help, Fiona said, still out of breath. And I was rubbish. But I was distracted, of course. Both by the utter humiliation of the situation, but also by the pigtails flying around me in the most girlish of fashions. Try harder, Polly said, you're being naughty. I'm really not, I gasped, failing on just two skips again. He still thinks he's a boy, Fiona said, doesn't want to skip properly like a good girl. Those boring boys' clothes don't help. Polly grabbed her friend's hand and jumped up and down. You're right, you're right. We can't let Olivia wear boys' clothes, can we? The pair of them were off and running before I could move leaving me standing in the garden alone, the skipping rope at my feet. I thought about following them, the cold blood running through me knowing what was coming and that I had to stop it, but I felt oddly frozen to the spot. A glance at my watch revealed it to be 4 p.m. Only an hour until Annie came home. Stop this nonsense, I whispered to myself, but the girls were already back. Put these on now, Polly said breathlessly, handing me a seemingly armful of clothes, change in the kitchen. This is going to be so funny, Fiona said, jumping around with Polly again, the pair of them clearly never having had such fun. I looked down at the clothes. It seemed to be some kind of tartan dress, I could just about recall Polly wearing it a couple of weeks before. That's enough, girls. You've had your fun, now it's time to stop. I don't mind holding the rope, but I'm not going to put... The girls looked at each other briefly, and then began to squeal in excitement. I'm not sure what happened next, or how they did it, but somehow, someway, I quickly found my trousers, socks and shirt taken off. This was bad enough, but Polly even took down my wife fronts, causing both girls to squeal again. Girls, stop! I cried out, for what felt like the hundredth time. Quick, quick, Fiona said, handing Polly what was quite clearly a pair of knickers, white like the pair I knew she were was wearing. Soon they'd been rolled up my legs, along with a pair of red socks with ruffles around the top and a white t-shirt with frills on the arms. To finish, both girls happily lowered the tartan dress over my arms and pulled it neatly into place, with Fiona tying the bow around the waist of the dress in a most ornate fashion. I can't, I can't believe, was about all I could muster. It fits him, Polly laughed, not a surprise really. The dress was more of a pinafore style, not unlike the gray one Polly was wearing, with the top only reaching halfway up my chest and two large frilled straps going over each shoulder. The skirt was short too short and pleated in a most girlish fashion, and I was shocked at how little and hairless my legs looked in the gap between the hem of the skirt and the ruffles of the socks. What a perfect little madam, Polly laughed. You look prettier than us, Olivia. We could take her out, Fiona said in amazement, everyone would think she's a girl. Right, let's try again, Olivia. See if being dressed properly helps you skip like a girl, Polly said, taking one end of the rope. I was in a state of shock. Apart from being shoeless, I'd somehow managed to find myself dressed head to toe in just the same manner as they were. An hour ago I'd been Uncle Oliver, a 35-year-old man. Now I was Olivia, one of the girls. One of the eleven-year-old girls, if you could believe it. Back to 369 Fiona, Polly instructed, as I took my place sheepishly in the middle, ready Olivia? I, I. 
was all I could manage, wincing at the soft wind circling around the pleated hem of the dress I found myself infeasibly wearing. Go! Polly cried out. And so, I skipped. Didn't have much choice. And I knew the skirt was short enough to flip up and show my knickers underneath. My knickers! What the hell had happened? You're getting better, Olivia, Polly said, laughing. I really was just part of the game now, taking my turn to hold the rope again when it was Polly or Fiona's turn, and singing the song as instructed. Polly had said I should use a girl voice, and they giggled at my effort. You sound just like us, Fiona said. You're adorable. My watch stolen, all I could do was try and guess the time. Neither girl seemed bothered about the impending homecoming, why should they, but I was starting to feel faint at the thought of it. I really need my clothes back now, I pleaded. The skipping had finally stopped, but Polly had told me to sit cross-legged with them on the grass to help them make daisy chains. You're wearing your clothes, Olivia, Polly laughed, a pretty little dress for a pretty little girl. No, I have to change, I said, standing up, I can't be seen like this. You will not, Polly yelled, the girls pulling me back again. Please, please, I yelled, spying my clothes by the kitchen door. Fun's over, all right. Stop this. Push him down, Polly said, with Fiona taking her now customary place on my back. Only difference now was that I could feel the dress riding upwards, so that the tops of my thighs were touching the cool, slightly damp grass. You're in your clothes, Olivia? Polly repeated, those are boys' clothes over there. Why would you want them? Polly, you. But it was too late. I knew it from the creak of the kitchen door. Then from the gasp of amazement and the demand for Fiona to get off me. What the hell is going on girls? Veronica said. I couldn't see her though. I'd kept my gaze firmly down at the grass below, quite unable to face them. We made Uncle Oliver pretty. Polly said sweetly, so he could skip with us. Isn't he pretty, mummy? What? I mean, how? Veronica stumbled. Is that your good dress, young lady? It'll be all dirty now. Sorry, mummy, I didn't think of that, Polly said. I'll help you clean it. And your socks too, Veronica continued. Then, with a quite audible gasp, she noticed a spot where the dress had ridden up too high, and are those. You made him wear, really, Polly, I can't believe this. Annie, I managed eventually, lifting my head with incredible sadness, I tried to stop them, I really did. I was near on sobbing now, which could hardly have helped my appearance. Come on, she shot, her voice far from kind. In fact she sounded angry, but I wasn't sure at who. She certainly didn't look at me though as I was grabbed by the hand and hauled back inside. My clothes, I sobbed as we passed them. Annie picked them up with a sigh. I can't believe this Oliver, I really can't believe it. It's not my fault, I said, they made me. Made you, she raged, made you. A couple of little girls made you put on a pretty frock. Made you put on a pair of knickers and frilly socks? Yes, I sobbed. Let's just get home. For crying out loud Oliver, let's just get home. But not like this. We can't go out the front. Someone might see. So what, Annie shout back, they'll just see me with a silly little girl, won't they? A silly little girl with her hair in pigtails and a pair of frilly socks. Annie. Please. It was then I noticed her new hair. A little shorter and bobbed at the shoulders. She looked incredible. What on earth was I supposed to do now? Asterisk Annie barely spoke to me for the next few days. She did make me return the clothing however, after I washed everything of course, and Veronica received them from me with no little humor on her face. I was completely lost. Even if Annie would speak to me, I had no idea what to say. Sorry for being dressed like a little girl by the little girl next door? It hardly rolled off the tongue. Suddenly the space between us and the bed seemed bigger than ever. Such was the bad feeling that, on the Wednesday night, I took my pillows to the spare room. I wasn't invited back the next night. She finally talked on Friday morning. Somewhat selfishly, she was concerned about her plans. 
Veronica and I were going to go to the club, but she doesn't want to pay a babysitter. I can do it, I said, in my smallest voice. I didn't want to. Hell, I didn't want to do anything less, but what other answer was there? Are you sure? She said, staring at me. We can't have a repeat of last time. There was two of them last time, I replied, feeling immediately stupid, I'll be fine with just Polly. I didn't even want to look at her in truth. She popped in after school one evening with Veronica, I spied them walking up the path with Polly still in her blue and white gingham school dress, and so I'd hidden away upstairs until they were gone. Seeing her in her little school uniform was quite a kick in the teeth though, and brought that humiliated feeling right back to the fore. Bullied by a little schoolgirl. That was me. Hello Uncle Oliver, she said in her sweetest voice when we arrived, her hair naturally pulled into pigtails and tied with the same bows she'd used on me. It wasn't hard to suspect she'd done it on purpose. I knew the real Polly, after all. Nothing naughty, madam, Veronica warned. I'll be a very, very good girl, Polly replied, I promise. Swirling around in her pink skirt, twiddling her pigtails, giving both Veronica and Annie a sweet little hug on her tiptoes. She didn't have me fooled. Not for a second. So, when she plumped herself wordlessly in front of the TV, and when she asked politely if I'd get her a glass of milk, I simply didn't know what her game was. She even went to bed on time, without complaint. This was worse than open hostility. I knew how James Bond felt now, dealing with all those schemers. The same happened over the new few weeks too. The odd disagreement about bedtimes perhaps, but otherwise a very well-behaved and polite little girl. I started to wonder if the whole dressing up as a girl thing wasn't a very big deal, Polly probably just saw it as similar to dressing a doll, as it was like it had never happened. If only Annie saw it that way. I wasn't back in the main bedroom, and Annie seemed just as distant as she had done since that awful day. Then came Yarmouth. It had been Veronica's idea to go away for the weekend. I wasn't keen, for obvious reasons, but in the spirit of trying to reconcile with Annie I agreed readily. It was only two nights, and only two hours in the car with Polly and the women. I was heartened to learn Veronica had booked two interconnecting double rooms, one for Annie and I and one for her and Polly. This was the chance, surely, to put rotten recent events to bed. Quite literally. We were supposed to set off early, but as I've often found with women a start time is merely a notional exercise. 7 a.m. became 8 a.m. 8 a.m. became 9 a.m. 9 a.m. became 10 a.m. Sitting in Veronica's living room with Polly watching TV I was keen to go, and happy when the women finally proclaimed they were ready. It was hot. Annie was wearing a pair of denim shorts, her new hairstyle pinned under a straw boater. She looked lovely as ever, her tanned, shapely legs somehow glowing in the late morning sunshine, and I realized how desperately I wanted things back to normal again. I was even willing to sit in the back of the car, with Polly. That's how desperate I was. That's nice of you, Annie said, giving me a rare smile as I climbed into the back. Mummy, I forgot my sunglasses, Polly said, I left them in my bag. Can I get them out? For crying out loud, I whispered. Never go on holiday with three women. Polly quickly jumped out and opened the boot, but then mumbled something about needing a wee and ran back into the house. This'll be fun, Veronica said. That sounded somewhat optimistic, but I was glad when we finally set off, tempered only by the realization that two hours next to Polly was in order. Are you still reading that boring book? She said, reviewing the front of You Only Live Twice. Boring? You nearly sobbed wanting to read it a few weeks ago. I did not. Polly yelled, a little too loudly. That garnered the first admonishment from the front of the car and I was amazed to find myself included in the firing line. If you two can't behave, we'll just go home, Annie said, sunning herself in the open window. The second telling off came when Polly, quite rudely, took a handful of my sherbet lemons. You should ask first. I said, trying to grab them back. This was more like the Polly I knew. Perhaps she just needed to be in a different county. Ha, ha, she giggled, 
shoving the four sweets into her mouth at the same time. Without really thinking about it, I reached over and pushed her dolly mixtures onto the floor, where they rolled out in a brightly colored mess across the car mat. Mummy, mummy, Polly yelled, Oliver threw my sweets on the floor, on purpose. Jesus Oliver, Annie said, swiveling her head, it's like having two children in the back. Are you ever going to grow up? The words hung in the air. I don't know about everyone else, but it certainly made me think of that tartan dress, and of skipping, and of fighting with Fiona and Polly. I said nothing. Yeah, Uncle Oliver, you're supposed to be a grown-up. You should behave like it, Polly said prissily, chin to the air. All in all I was glad when we finally arrived and gallantly, and perhaps in need of proving my masculinity all over again, I offered to lift the suitcases out of the trunk. Annie gave me a little look, one which suggested I might struggle, but I just about managed it. Quite why the women needed two full suitcases, as well as bag for shoes and god knows what, was beyond me. Even Polly's pink suitcase was heavy, though I tried my best to make it look light. That's when I realized. My brown weekend bag wasn't there. I looked, somewhat panicked, under an old blanket, and then back at the cases I'd unloaded, but it was missing. I definitely put it in here. I said, almost sure of it. I could remember packing it and bringing it downstairs, but could I remember loading it in? I was sure I could. Almost certain. What's up? Veronica asked, adjusting her sunglasses. My case, it's not there, I said in rushed tones. Oh, for crying out loud Oliver, you're joking, right? Annie said in a stomp. I definitely put it in. Definitely, I said. That's when I caught her eye. Polly, standing all sweetly by her pink case, staring at me through her pink heart-shaped sunglasses. Eating my sherbet lemons again. She did this. I yelled. She took my case out. What? No, I didn't. Polly said, looking genuinely surprised at the accusation. You must have done. When you ran back inside. It's obvious. Oliver, stop being ridiculous. Why would Polly do that? Annie said. Because she's a brat, that's why, I said, quite unable to keep my cool. Oliver, be quiet. Annie said hotly. I didn't mummy, I didn't, Polly said to Veronica in little sobs, he's horrible to me. Of course, here come the crocodile tears, I laughed, doesn't help me get my case back, does it? Little bitch. I was shocked enough at myself, but it was nothing compared to the expression on Annie's face, how dare you? How dare you? You don't know what she's like, I said, she can fool you too. But not me. This was when Annie grabbed me by the arm and walked me into the hotel lobby, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, she kept saying, and when Veronica was booking in I found myself pulled tightly against her, like a little boy contained by mummy. Get in there, she stormed, throwing me into the room, while Veronica and Polly headed next door, don't say a word Oliver, not a word. You don't understand, she. Be quiet, she shouted, barely able to look at me the whole way here, squabbling with her in the back seat. Calling her, calling her a bitch. What's wrong with you? You're a grown man. You're supposed to be my husband. You don't know what. Stop it, stop it, she yelled. I wished I had stopped. God, I wish I had. You just can't see it. She planned all this. She knew exactly what she was doing. Oh yes, all sweetness the last few weeks, just waiting for a chance though. Don't you see it? Really, don't you? I was fully aware of how I sounded but just couldn't stop myself. Hell, I was pretty close to stomping my feet and throwing a tantrum. It didn't help my cause. Not one little bit. You know what, if you're going to act like a child, then I'm going to treat you like one. She stood up and opened the connecting door, returning moments later with Veronica's case. This is going to be grown-up's room. You can go next door in the children's bedroom. Annie, you're not serious? Never more serious. When you act like a grown-up, I'll start treating you like one. Next door, now. But I didn't budge. 
How could I? We need to talk, Annie. We need to talk right now. No, we don't, she yelled, grabbing my arm and then, to my absolute astonishment, lifting me up until she was cradling my entire body, leaving me looking up at her. Annie, Annie, let me down. I squirmed. Polly looked as surprised as anyone as I was deposited on the double bed. What's Uncle Oliver doing in here? I can't stand it anymore, Annie continued, you don't deserve to be a man. She paused and looked at Polly, before looking back at me. And you certainly don't deserve to wear men's clothes. They're for proper men. Not wimps who argue with little girls and skip rope in short skirts. Stop Annie, I said, as she easily overpowered me, removing my shorts and t-shirts with barest of fuss. No Annie, please. I'm sorry. You're very sorry, she spat, and you're going to be even sorrier. She had Polly open her case, the girl was only too happy to do so, and then had my new roommate pick out an outfit for Annie's silly husband. Anything? Polly asked excitedly. Anything that'll suit your little sister, Annie said, pulling off my wife fronts. Oh, this is so much fun, Polly gasped. This is what's going to happen, Annie said, taking the pink and white polka dot knickers from a delighted Polly and running them up my legs, you act like a little girl, we'll treat you like one. Annie, I don't mean it. I'm sorry, okay? You've said that already, she replied coldly, running a pair of frilled white ankle socks over my feet. This will suit him, Polly said, handing her a dress, perfect with his blonde hair. I don't really like it anymore. And it's a bit short on me. It was a pink and white striped sundress, with bows on the straps and some kind of petal embellishment on the hem of the skirt. It fell to my mid-thigh and felt humiliatingly loose and floaty around my tiny frame. I'll do her hair, Polly said, quickly finding two pink flower hair clips from her sparkly bag and using them to tie my hair into large bunches. While doing so, Annie forced my feet into a pair of Polly's sparkly jelly pink jelly sandals, which were too small but which somehow stayed on my little feet. Veronica joined in, Polly, darling, why don't you choose some of your clothes and put them in your sister's cupboard? The silly thing forgot her case, didn't she? You don't mind, do you? Oh no, Polly said, I brought loads. Well maybe we should let Olivia pick, if you don't mind? Annie said, pushing me towards Polly's case. Oh, I don't mind at all, Polly replied, I like to share. Go on Olivia, Annie said, knickers and socks first. Good girl. I felt weak. Almost like I might faint. All I could feel was the sundress fluttering around me and my bunched hair bounce against my shoulders, and that was before the awful trim of the knickers pushing against my waist. Three pairs of knickers and socks, I think, Annie said. Totally beaten, I picked three pairs at random from the row Polly had helpfully laid out. Pretty, Veronica said. She likes polka dots, I see. Polly wasn't stupid. When it came to laying out a selection of bottoms, she made sure only skirts were available. And when I had to pick out three dresses, the six laid out were equally girly. She needs a cossy too, Polly ventured, laying out four swimming costumes. Two childish bikinis in aqua blue and pink, and two frilled costumes in lavender and yellow, both with frills on the bum. You have to be joking, I muttered. Give her the bikinis, Annie said, they're just too precious. Okay Auntie Annie, Polly said, running over to put the bikinis in my draw. Now little lady, Annie said, turning to me, what do you say to Polly for letting you borrow her clothes? After you forgot yours, like the silly little Billy you are? I looked sadly over at Polly, who was beaming happily right back. Thank you Polly. Oh no no, Annie laughed, that's not good enough. Give your sister a nice girly hug and a little kiss and say thank you like a polite little girl should do. I walked over slowly and did indeed give her a hug and a kiss on the cheek, suddenly very aware of being smaller than her. Thank you Polly. It was very kind of you. What was? Annie barked. Two. Lend me your clothes, I muttered. Annie shook her head, not good enough, Missy. You're a sweet little girl this weekend, so you better start acting like it. She pulled me around to face her, hands in hers. Now, tell us your name and how old you are. 
How old I am? Well Polly's eleven and she's your big sister, so work it out, Veronica interjected. I was lost again, so thoroughly defeated that I just wanted to keep everyone happy. I'm Olivia and… I looked around the room, and I'm nine years old. Nine. I thought you'd say ten. Annie laughed. But nine is good too. Now, who am I, Olivia? You're my mummy, I whispered. Of course I'm not. What does Polly call me? I took a deep breath, Auntie Annie. How had it come to this? That I was calling my wife Auntie, while squirming around in a cute little sundress. Good girl, Annie replied, patting me on the head and then pointing towards Veronica, so who's that? I felt my blood run cold yet again. Oh please, I don't. Olivia, be good now. Who is it? I looked down at the ground. Mommy. Veronica laughed. Oh how precious. Nearly there, madam, Annie said, pointing at Polly. Who's that? That's, Polly, I said, my, my, I wanted to cry, my big sister. Good girl. See, not so hard, is it? So, if she's your big sister, and you're a girl, what does that make you? Her, little, sister, I whimpered. That's right. And because you're such a little girl, you make sure you do whatever your big sister tells you, understood? And when we go out, you're to hold an adult's, or your big sister's, hand. I nodded. So, one last try, let's see you thank your big sister for all your pretty clothes. I sidled over slowly and sadly, giving her yet another hug and kiss, thank you Polly for being the best big sister in the world, and letting me borrow your pretty clothes. You're welcome, Olivia, she grinned, taking hold of my hand, you're such a good girl, aren't you?